Hey, folks, welcome once again to There's Just Something About Kansas City, where we get in conversations with the people and talk about the places and things that make this such a great place to live. And uh, it's just one of those hidden gems in the United States. And I couldn't be more honored or happy to have this guy sitting across from me today, uh, David Von Draley, uh, New York Times bestselling author. Uh, now a Kansas City resident, at least for um, you know, at least the last few years. We will get back to his background uh, as we go. But uh, David, welcome to. There's just something about Kansas City. Thanks for having me, Frank. Yeah, you bet. Um, let's talk a little bit about your background. Of course, you have your your uh, New York Times bestselling book, The Book of Charlie. I've read that book. Um, I have what I feel like I'm back in college in lit <laughs> class, and I feel like I have a book report sitting right in front of me about all the notes I was taking down, and it really interested me, his the background with him and how you met him and the wisdom he bestowed on you and 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 the things about it. And I think one of the things you said in the book was I wish I had talking to my grandparents more, you know? Yep. And so if anybody gets anything out of this today, if your grandparents are still alive or your great-grandparents are still alive, might be a good idea to pick their brains a little bit about life and what happens over a long period of time as you're cruising around this, uh, cruising around the sun. Absolutely. I um, I say in the, in the book that uh, I think there's two phases of life that we go through. First, I call... Uh, we're complexifiers. Um, I may have invented that word, but uh, <laughs> it's okay. You know, you start out in the innocence of childhood, and you start discovering that life's not quite as simple as people told you. It's more complicated. Uh, there's more nuances. Uh, people are not always straightforward. Events are not always uh, simple. Uh, but if you live long enough, um, you become a simplifier. And uh, a lot of the complexity starts to fall away. And even though life may still be complicated, what we should do about it, how we should live, how we should treat others, uh, how we should be in our community, uh, becomes pretty simple. And uh, Charlie was a, a model of that. Yeah, and... Uh we throw out, it's like making a move from or downsizing in a house. Okay, okay, we've had enough. The kids are gone. Time to move. And you start throwing things away. You yep. just throw in, well, we haven't, I haven't used that dust covered. It's this thick on it or whatever. We just start throwing them out or giving them away mm -hmm. or whatever we're doing. But that's basically what, you know, Dr. Charles White did, didn't he? <laughs> exactly. And he came down to uh, some very simple life lessons. And uh, I was lucky enough to uh, it just freak accident of life to uh, to find myself living across the street from one of the world's oldest men uh, who wasn't just old but was uh, in complete possession of all his faculties uh, sharp uh, as, as sharp in the brain uh, at 108 as he was uh, incredible. <laughs> to begin and uh, still and driving a car still had girlfriends you know <laughs> the whole thing yeah, right? <laughs> I, 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 he spent virtually his whole life in Kansas City so now that the book is out I keep meeting people who knew him and had have different stories about him and one of them reminded me I had forgotten that uh, he actually got his driver's license renewed at 104. <laughs> I, I'm surprised they still give you a driver's if, license. They, if you're, Most if times, you're like Charlie, yeah. <laughs> Most times they're taking your keys away from you by 80, not by yeah. you know 104. Wow, exactly. He's a, yeah, he's a phenomenal guy. And we'll talk more about the book as we go. New York Times bestseller, the book of Charlie. I think, folks, it, and it's not because David is sitting across from me. It's just there is so much to glean from this book that would impact virtually anybody. Uh, do, during their daily lives or during the time that, that they grow up. And I think it should be required reading for college students and kids just as they, as you say, you know, now all of a sudden life isn't so innocent anymore. It's going to throw you some curveballs. Yeah. it's. Uh, I, I really wrote the book with my own kids in mind. They're in their 20s now. Um, and <clears throat> I realized that uh, they're going to live through extraordinary changes uh, in this uh, 21st century, you look at what technology is mm -hmm. doing, uh, artificial intelligence, all of these, you know, 
climate change and how we're going to react to that, the cha changing job market. I realized I didn't know that much about how to navigate change because my world, which started in 1961, you know, a lot of gadgets changed, but, you know, there was television when I was born. There's still television now, radio. But to find someone who was born at the beginning of the 20th century, which is the most changed, you know, most dramatically changing, dynamic century of American history, and who lived through that whole century. You know, Charlie was born uh, before radio, uh, and lived to uh, own a, an iPhone. Uh, he was born before a flight and lived to see people on the International Space Station. He was born uh, when they're <clears throat> in the days of horse and buggies, you know, and lived to, uh, uh, to uh, you know, in, into the world of automobiles and race cars. The, and, and automobiles know. that may soon drive themselves. <laughs> that may soon, exactly, <laughs> drive themselves. And uh, this was tremendous amount of change, uh, not, not to mention in his own field, uh, he was a doctor. Uh, medicine was completely transformed in his lifetime. Everything he learned in college and medical school was obsolete by the middle of his career. Uh, so he had this attitude of, of lifelong learning. We call it. Of uh, uh, he 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 dealt with some, you know, huge setbacks and disappointments, and learned uh, to l let the bad stuff go, to uh, focus on the positive, how to be useful, how to be helpful to other people, um, and it was a source uh, not just of happiness but of calm, of contentment. Um, and satisfaction with his life, which is really what we're all after, I think. Yeah, I, yeah, I absolutely. I, I also think, too, you use the word stoic in there, and I think a lot of people, and you you even said it, and I think people misinterpret what that word actually means. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it, to him, every time he ran into a roadblock, he made sure he then didn't stop there. Right. And he just figured, okay, I got a problem here. Now I'm going to solve the problem. I'm going to step around a roadblock and keep on going. Yeah. So Stoicism is this uh, ancient philosophy from the Greeks and and the Romans. Um, has a pretty bad, you know, uh, reputation, as you point out. It, it people use the word to mean unfeeling, uh, emotionally repressed, um, but it, it it's really the opposite. It's the source of true freedom because what the Stoics teach is that um, there are some things in life that we can control, and those are the products of our own will, the decisions we make, the choices mm -hmm. we make, the, the tasks that we undertake, uh, the goals that we set for ourselves, priorities that we embrace, and everything else is outside of our control, um, other people. You know, anybody who's ever been a parent of a teenager knows Yikes. that we don't control <laughs> any other people. Zero. <laughs> yeah. Um, but we don't control what the government's going to do or much less what the weather's going to be. Or, you know, Charlie's father died in a freak accident when Charlie was a, a little, little boy. Horrifying freak yeah, accident. Exactly. Yeah. You know, it, it, not in his control. That, this stuff this stuff happens. And uh, but we can control how we respond and how we, as you say, go around the obstacle. Uh, there's a wonderful saying in Stoicism: "The obstacle is the way. Uh, the obstacles make us stronger if we react to them uh, in the right way." Right. So uh, I think Charlie uh, was a natural Stoic. It came just came to him. Uh, naturally, and he was a great model for me. Uh, I've been having people try to teach me Stoicism since I was a college kid. Yeah, and it's easy to understand. It's harder to uh, <laughs> try to, to put it in motion, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, but Charlie was a great model for me. Yeah, he he was. He's an extremely interesting character. I, like I said, I can't 
And I've been a reader all my life, and I just uh, I can't recommend the book highly enough. It was oh, just one of those things you just couldn't put down. You wanted to get to the next chapter. And, and Charlie's, and, and Charlie's uh, philosophy in life basically was can't do anything about yesterday. Right. Okay. You have no idea what's coming tomorrow, mm -hmm. okay? So just live in the present. Live for today. Live in the present moment. It's uh, it's it's freeing, and it gives you purpose. It, uh, and it, it, it just... It, uh, that's what I... You, you, Stoicism is a philosophy has been embraced and written about by... Uh, Emperor of Rome, you know, Marcus Aurelius, mm -hmm. his meditations, a famous Stoic book, all the way to slaves, uh, Epictetus, uh, the, 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 the writer Viktor Frankl, the great Stoic of the Holocaust, oh, the Holocaust was Holocaust, ens right. enslaved by the Nazis. Um, and it speaks to everybody because it does put us in touch with the present moment. This is the one moment we have. Yes, and we talked to Big Sonia, and she mentioned Viktor Frankl, and the ultimate Stoic was Big Sonia. Yeah. I mean, my gosh, what she has seen in her mind at 97 years old is she's still as sharp as ever. Yep. And I think the reason she is so sharp is because those images were ingrained in her mind at that time, and for a long time she wouldn't talk about it, and then she overheard someone say, um, it really didn't happen. Yeah. It was all made up like the moon landing or something else they try to keep <laughs> bringing back that didn't happen. And she just decided it's time for me to let people know this did happen. Yes. And Charlie is the same way. Right. Yeah. So it was uh, really interesting. So for you, and, and I know you have your, your history is just incredible. I know you were uh, born in Denver and raised in Aurora, Colorado, which... Yep. All the people from Kansas City, I'm sure, have gone right by Aurora <laughs> suburbs or driving to Denver or the it's, mountains, it's, right? It's where where you pass through on your way to somewhere That's, else. You just That's wave, right. yeah. People say that a lot about Kansas City, too, the old flyover yeah. deal. But, uh, yeah, and so well, what was that experience like for you in, in the Colorado experience? I know you went to the University of Denver as well. It was a great place to, to grow up. Um, we had a very... Uh, it's funny because I was just talking uh, to a colleague of mine who grew up here in Lenexa, and he was describing their house, uh, you know, amid empty lots with uh, Flum Road here. It was still dirt. And I said, that's exactly what my childhood was like, watching a, a city grow up around us. You know, we were the end of the world um, uh, in the Denver area when I was a little kid, and now my home is practically downtown. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. It just takes a yeah, minute to get it, there. Yeah, that's right. So um, it, and it was a, a fun place to grow up, yeah. Um, did, did you spend a lot of time in the mountains? We, my dad was not an outdoorsman, okay. um, but uh, w we did, and you know, certainly as I got older and got into college, we spent more time up there. Yeah, yeah you're at the, I miss it. Right, you're at the university. I'll bet you do, yeah. Uh, you're at the University of Denver. But before that, I think just coming out of high school, I guess you knew almost, at least in some form or another, where you were headed in life a little bit because I think you walk out you, you walk in 17 years of Denver Post and say, where's my job? <laughs> you know, and I, I think you're still in high school at the time, and I know – Maybe sports writing or writing for the paper in general or whatever. Was it just floating around your mind that this may be the way I'm going to go eventually? Yeah, well, uh, like a lot of teenage guys in the 1970s, mm -hmm. um, I lived for Sports Illustrated magazine. You know, the the sports writing 51 weeks of the year and the swimsuit issue. <laughs> we <laughs> won't leave February. that one out, okay? I wasn't going to mention that, but I just let you have it, okay? <laughs> um, so I did uh, I did have notions that I might uh, have a life as a, a sports writer. And um, my journalism teacher in high school knew about a, a job at the Denver Post on Friday and Saturday nights, uh, writing up uh, high school sports mm -hmm. scores, and he encouraged me to apply. Um, and uh, 
it was the scariest thing I think I've ever done in my life. They, I later learned that they'd never hired a high school kid before and that the uh, sports editor had gotten the impression that I was a senior in college. Um, and, <laughs> I like that. And uh, I, I like to say I'm the only Denver Post uh, reporter who ever had to ask for a night off to go to the prom. <laughs> So while you were there, I'm not sure who the sports editor was, but I know Woody Page was probably yeah, there at that Woody time. Was, there. Was, uh, was this before Schefter, Adam Schefter? Yeah, it was a <clears> little bit Adam, before right? Adam okay. Schefter. And there was one other columnist of sports Steve column. Steve Cameron. That's right. Yeah. Steve Cameron, absolutely. Yeah. And Woody Page were two just they huge were guys huge. nationally. They, right? uh, they revolutionized uh, Denver sports writing. Um uh, but the guy I grew up on was a fellow named uh, Dick Connor, um, and he was Colorado Sports Writer of the Year for like 20 years in a row or right. something like that. Yeah. And uh, one of the great moments of my life was I went in for the job interview. I had to call three times to get an interview, and I had they had a test that you had to take, and one of the tests uh, just gave a bunch of names of people, and it, you had to identify who they were. And uh, one of them was the Western painter, uh, Charles Russell. Oh, yes. And mm -hmm. um, my interview, after I took the test, went to sit with uh, Bick Lucas, was the sports editor's name, and he was right out of a movie, you know, had a cigar in his oh, mouth, yeah. and, uh, <laughs> gruff speaking, and sleeves uh, rolled up, ink stains yeah, all over him. Yeah, he didn't even <laughs> he didn't even look at me. He just said, uh, "Why did you put for Charles Russell?" And I said, uh, "Western painter of you know cowboy scenes," and uh, he did, still didn't look at me. He just yelled across the room at my hero, Dick Connor, and said, "Hey, Connor." The kid got it right. <laughs> <laughs> and listen, there is a lesson there, everyone, okay? It's the more you know, okay, and the more you diversify. So eventually you go to University of Denver then. You're right there in town. Did you continue to work? In, I did all through for the college. Did you write for the paper at that time? I did. I got, I, got, I got super <laughs> lucky uh, because the, the family that owned the paper sold it to Times Mirror, a uh, big uh, – newspaper chain um, out of Los Angeles. And Times Mirror had the idea that the way to win the newspaper war in Denver was more sports coverage. Mm -hmm. And they poured just acres of space and money into the paper, and they didn't have enough people to fill right. it up. So all of a sudden, I went from writing little two-paragraph stories about the high school sports game to – literally getting on the road and you know i came out uh, came out here for a series between the royals and the twins uh, uh and i think the red sox must have come through because i wrote a feature on wade boggs and mm -hmm. his rookie year you know so i was all, all of a sudden writing these huge stories um while i was still in college and traveling yeah, you know, and trying to then juggle the books and the whole thing. But you obviously did pretty and well. Showing, showing up, at, you know, in in uh, you know baseball managers' offices, <laughs> obviously, you know, young and inexperienced. And I, uh, I don't know if you remember a <clears throat> crazy ball player, uh, Doug Rader. They called him uh, the Mad Rooster. Yes, um, he was uh, managing uh, the Rangers. Uh, and they sent me down there to do a feature because he had the Rangers winning for a little, not long. Uh, but I got he, he. I asked him some question in his office, and he he literally threw a baseball at my head. <laughs> <laughs> what was it? Hey Doug, what did you have for breakfast this morning? <laughs> Just trying to break the ice here. All right. Or or you called him coach. One of the other <laughs> because something. they don't like to be called coach something either. Like yeah. That. Absolutely. So you go through the University of Denver, obviously did very well. And then how soon after that did you have to make a decision? I know you went to Oxford, which yeah. is incredible. Um, <clears throat> when did you have to make that decision? I'm in college, I'm doing all this right, and I could probably I'm gonna basically have a job when I get out at the Denver Post yeah. for all which would be 
99% of the journalism students are going, oh, my God, what yeah. a great break that is. But you obviously didn't didn't go that way. Yeah, I well, I went off to <clears throat> graduate school thinking I was going to be a college professor. Okay. And <clears throat> graduate school quickly cured me of that. Uh, and they made a deal with me. I'm not kidding. I won't bore you with the whole story, but... Uh, they gave me my master's degree in exchange for me promising to stop uh, pursuing an academic <laughs> career. <laughs> and and the reason behind all this might be pretty interesting. Uh, well, I just you know I wasn't cut out for uh, English literature. Uh, I thought it was different than it you yeah. know was becoming, and um, <laughs> so uh, I had written a master's thesis, and they. Uh, uh, they let me buy as long as they didn't have to worry about meeting me at a, you know, a modern language association <laughs> meeting somewhere down the road and having all their colleagues say, you, you guys put, passed him through. Uh, so the one thing I knew how to do was uh, newspaper writing. Right. And I sent out my clips uh, all over the country. I got uh, uh, the Denver Post said we'd love to have you back that was nice uh, they recommended me for a columnist job in Fort Worth so that was on the table but the Miami Herald of all the papers that I hit uh, saw something in me and uh, invited me down interviewed me and offered me a just a tremendous job this was the 80s now and Miami at that time was just the it's the the mecca for young journalistic talent. Um, so many of the top people in the business now were kids, you know, all together uh, down there, and they offered, but they wanted me to become a news writer um, and offered me a job on the city desk. And uh, sports editor said, you can come back any time and be a sports writer. And I always, for a long time, thought I would. Mm -hmm. but, uh, sure, especially with your past experiences. Yeah, yeah. the way things uh, led one to another. Uh, never got back to sports. Yeah, right. Well, you started, too. I, I think if you read the books, the book of Charlie, and, of course, Triangle, and uh, Among the Lowest of Dead, you wrote about capital punishment, uh, America's Closest Election with George W. and uh, – <laughs> I was going to say Al Gore, but You're right. Al, Al Gore, Gore, right? Yes. George W. And Al Gore, and then the Triangle, and then um, Road to Greatness with um, uh, Abraham Lincoln talked about him in the most important year, and uh, just so I, I think your mind was way more diversified than covering the Denver Broncos every day, or you know, which would up in Denver would be the oh boy, that's yeah. the one we want is that's to cover the, the Denver Broncos. Yeah. yeah, it's the biggest job in yeah. in Colorado, and. Uh, uh, I do. I've always rebelled against having a beat or, yes. or doing the same. Th I, I, um, it, it's part of the reason I washed out uh, of graduate school is that I, I can get super interested in something for a short time, but I really uh, don't like the idea of doing the same thing for the rest of my life. Yeah, right. So Yeah, you don't want to read Dickens every no. week. And, and, right. and grab a little Ian Fleming it, once it's never, James Bond. Yeah, right. exactly. And it's <laughs> it's that it's not even Dickens, but it, it'd be like one novel oh, of Dickens. You'd sure. be the world's expert in Nicholas Nickleby or something. Oh, and, and that's I, I respect that. And we need people who specialize and actually know what they're talking about. But um, I'm more of a popularizer. Right. And then you went to the Washington Post, I believe, after that. Yep. And how'd that transpire? Um, the, I, the Miami Herald sent me to New York for a couple of uh, years as their New York correspondent, probably the best job I ever had uh, because I just lived in New York and assigned myself stories and wrote whatever I wanted. And it was a great time wild time in New York, um, and uh, they wanted me to come back, and I didn't want to live the rest of my life in South Florida. Um, and so I cast about for a job and um, uh, managed just stroke of timing. Uh, the, the, the Washington Post New York bureau chief uh, left and 
took another job. Right. And they said, well, the office is empty. You want to be our New York bureau chief? Uh, <laughs> so there you go. Oh, sure. Kidding? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, why not? Uh, <laughs> And, and you covered everything from politics to arts and... Uh, that was, yeah, again, I had the whole, you know, New York and the Northeast as my, uh, as my uh, stomping ground. It was wonderful, but they, among the things is they sent me to, uh, this was 91, late, 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 and they sent me up to uh, New Hampshire because the great legendary political writer David Broder wanted the weekend off. So go up to New Hampshire and spell Broder. Um, this was when uh, Bill Clinton was running for president the first time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I went up there and I guess they liked the stories I did because they told me to go home, repack a bigger suitcase, and I was now a politics writer. That's right. So Get on the road. There are people who... I, I've always said I'm the luckiest person I've ever met. You know, there there are people who, uh, you know, really good, talented people who know what they're talking about that work, you know, forever to be a politics writer for the Washington Post, and mm -hmm. I just fell into it. Well, I think the diversification helped, though, mm -hmm. you know, because you have covered everything, you cover any angle of it, and there's an offshoot of what you're covering in the presidential election, there was an offshoot over here. They knew yep. you'd yep. be able to, to, to cover that as well. You go from the post then, and uh, where'd you meet Karen, your wife? On that campaign, um, Karen was a young uh, Associated Press writer in the Washington Bureau. And uh, I think it was the weekend before mm -hmm. Super Tuesday, 1992. So this is uh, March. Um I looked up at an event and um, turned to one of my colleagues who had been out uh, on that particular campaign for a while. I s pointed at her and said, who is that? <laughs> <laughs> and did we get a point back? And she went, who is that? <laughs> or, or was this a one-way street for a little bit of time? I think we, we uh, hit it off pretty quickly. Pretty good. Yeah, pretty right. Quickly. Right. And then uh, you eventually uh, go to Time Magazine mm -hmm. in 2006, I think, and you end up writing 60 cover stories for Time Magazine, which is – Incredible. And again, it's the diversification and the subject matter and everything you covered for Time Magazine. I mean, it covers a different genre, story, you know, whatever. Every week there has to be something. It's not yeah. something you, you just do do one subject the whole time. So. No, there's, I, everything from the death of Osama bin Laden to uh, death of Michael Jackson to... Uh, uh, how we have too many deer in America now <laughs> to, uh, uh, you know, the rise of ISIS, uh, uh, Barack Obama, you know, Donald Trump. Uh, so uh, he, I love that about the job. I, I never knew from one week to the next what I would be um, thrown into. Right. And it, it was exciting. Um and uh, that's how I got to Kansas City. Uh, Time magazine uh, said, we don't care where you live. Um, and so uh, we, we loved Washington, D.C., but we had four kids uh, at that point, And it was getting more and more expensive and more and more crowded. And the traffic was getting worse and worse. And uh, we decided to... Simplify. Yeah, you decide to throw some of the stuff away, right? Yep. Move. Okay, so the move from there, obviously, there was probably a little pool for you to go back to the front range of the Rockies. And of course, then of course, Karen steps in and she is from Kansas City, right? She had Karen's a, from yeah. Kansas City and uh, she had some family here. Um, still, she was actually a, a kind of mixed minds about. Kansas City. She she said, I spent the first 18 years of my life trying to leave Kansas City, <laughs> as as people do. But this is a city that pulls people back, you know, uh, because it's such a great quality of life. 
my mother and my wife, two super dynamic, strong women who did best with a little bit of distance between them. So uh, that took going home to Denver <laughs> off the table. <laughs> Okay, I sort of get it now. Okay, yeah, I I understand. But so, there were probably was some discussion about either Denver, the Colorado area, somewhere, or here mm-hmm. in in the Midwest with Kansas City. But uh, you made the right choice, I think. I I, I absolutely <laughs> have uh, fallen in love with Kansas City in the sixteen years that we've been here. Um, I, in fact, I wrote last fall wrote a column for the Post about the the ultimate final step of having to you know come clean with my uh, siblings that I am a Chiefs fan. Oh boy. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. not good. <laughs> Have you been invited back for Thanksgiving or Christmas? I don't know or that I'll ever family be. Family reunion? I don't anything? know that I'll ever. You know, my mother had passed away, and I felt it, it would have killed her if uh, <laughs> if I'd told her that. Uh, so. Uh, but honesty, you know, forced me to, uh, and I don't. It's not a fair weather thing. It's not just because the Broncos have become uh, terrible. Chiefs have beaten them like a hundred times in yeah, a row or something and like the that. The Chiefs yeah. are, are the most exciting <laughs> team in football. It's uh, uh, because you know, having grown up in Denver mm-hmm. before John Elway, uh, I watched the Broncos lose a lot of games, a lot of football games, right. uh, while remaining faithful. But uh, yeah. The, and, Chiefs are just such a uh, uh, God. What an exciting time to be in Kansas. Oh, City. absolutely! And you were here for sixteen. You've been here for sixteen years, so they weren't always great. They during were not always time. great. Okay, no, so they were not. you went through some ups and downs <laughs> as well. Now they're at the, uh, the the ultimate up. Going back to now, you live across the street from from Charlie, and that's where the book of Charlie came from. One of the most interesting things for me, because uh, Sarah and I have a lot of kids between us. Um, you, the kids asked you to write a book for them. Did, had you met Charlie already and decided, that, okay, he will be the book I write for them, or no, was it, it was, the, they asked you to write a book for them, and Charlie was there? Yeah, well, I I, I met Charlie as soon as we moved into our new house. The in fact the house was still full of, you know, moving boxes, mm-hmm. half half empty. Um, And one August morning in 2007, I went out to pick up the newspaper and um, looked up. And in the driveway across the street, there was a gentleman uh, in a pair of swim trunks, um, big muscular chest, wavy hair. uh, And he was washing his girlfriend's car with a garden hose and a sponge. And he (laughs) paused and waved to me and... uh, I I knew that he had just had his hundred and second birthday. He's now remember, folks. We just said muscular guy, wavy hair, washing his girlfriend's car out in front of the house. Meaning the girl was probably eight or nine in the morning. Had probably spent the evening. Yeah. Yeah, she was inside. <laughs> uh, and I said to myself, "This is somebody I have to get to know." Um, yeah. But you don't think even some remarkable specimen like that. You don't think you're making an, a long-time friendship when you meet somebody who's 102. <laughs> but uh, Charlie and I were f- friends for s- seven years. Um, no, the k- kids, uh, one of the things that I really enjoyed as dad, w- because our kids are really close together mm-hmm. in age, was uh, I'd get them all into bed and then I'd sit in the in the hallway outside the bedrooms and read to them every night. And we went. So through. they all could hear you. Yeah, they all could. So you hear. didn't have to go from bedroom <laughs> from to bedroom, bedroom to bedroom to bedroom. To bedroom. <laughs> um, and uh, this went on for years. We covered a lot of good books. Um, and when they got old enough to know that I was a writer of some some kind, they started asking me to write a book for them and they had in mind, you know, pirates and or time sure. travel or wizards. Uh, um, and I actually tried, but that's harder than it looks to write a good children's book. Um, or at least I don't have that move. But um, as time went by, I realized that the, the book of Charlie was, this was a story that 
it might not be the one they wanted, but mm -hmm. it was the one that I think they need and can use all through their lives. So I do want to make clear, though, that um, I wasn't visiting Charlie with an agenda. Um, right. I, I, we were friends, uh, and it was only after he passed away that I began to realize that there was a book here. Yeah. Did, did you had you record any conversations conversation with him or did you just were friends and you just we were and just then you friends. remembered the he, stories? He, yeah, he never he had no idea that he'd be a book. Right. Um, uh, I was lucky, uh, you know, going back to where we started the conversation, that his family had hired a uh an oral historian to record Yes. Uh, his life story. So they had a really good three hours of interviews, mm. sort of like this that we're doing now, um, with Charlie. And they made those available to me. Uh, I had heard all the stories that he told in, in, in those interviews, uh, many of them more than once. But it was super helpful to have the recordings because when I visited Charlie... We were just a couple of friends talking. Yeah, right. And the thing for me, because I remember lying in bed with, uh, you know, my kids, and I wasn't smart enough to lay out in the hallway and <laughs> read them all the same book at the same time, but lying in bed with kids and reading different books to them, and there was always the next one. And then, you know, some nights there were 15 <laughs> books piled on the bed or whatever. Uh, but when you said that, that you laid down in the hallway and you read to them, that brought back a lot of great memories. Yeah. And have they become read are they readers which is in this day and age there aren't a whole lot of yeah. these young kids they don't read they listen to podcasts or they might have a book on tape or whatever but they don't basically sit down and just just read books to read for enjoyment pleasure knowledge whatever it is i one of the things i love about my four kids is that they are four very different human beings each uh, so the answer is you know across the board there. But my favorite review of the book of Charlie that I've gotten was from my oldest daughter who said that uh, high school had made her uh, hate reading mm -hmm. and that book of Charlie had brought her back and she's reading again. In fact, she said she started a book club. <laughs> oh, gosh, oh, yeah. 20. Okay, don't forget to buy my dad's book. Okay, don't forget. That's that's some, If you want to belong to this book club, it's very easy. Okay? <laughs> so that's that's neat because there is, um, uh, you know, the, what I remind people of who talk about this young generation as non-readers, uh, there's some truth to that. But in fact, you know, they grew up as terrific readers. I mean, you think about the, you know, Harry Potter series mm -hmm. is the, probably the most successful. It's one successful. of the ones I read, read yeah, with my one right. daughter. Yeah, and, uh, you know, that's these kids uh, who made that one of the biggest selling uh, series of books in history, but not just Harry Potter, you know, a uh, series of unfortunate events and uh, the Dave Barry, uh, Peter and the Star Catchers series. Yeah. You know, you just go down the list. There's these, Bell, Book, and uh, Candle. Yeah, Mm -hmm. um, uh, Captain Underpants, uh, right. the, the Diaries of a Wimpy Kid. There's all these series that have been blockbuster sellers, and that's that's this generation of kids. So they, yeah. they know books, and we just need to they, give them good ones to read. They need a spark to get going. Who, who did you read when you were young? Who, who did you? Were you always a reader? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I always had uh, my nose in a book. Um uh, and I read everything. I think probably owe oh, my reading habit most to Dr. Seuss. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but um, oh my God, I've I, I've lost track of how many times I've read Charlotte's Web in oh, my yeah. life. You know, and interpreted differently every time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's definitely a thing. I, I hate to tell you this, but one of the things that really got me interested in reading when I was young, I think I was homesick for a wee a little library next to the fireplaces. And they had that um, Journeys Through Bookland read. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Back yeah. And they had all the no they had, you know, Hans Christian Andersen, mm -hmm. Shipwrecked, yeah. Robinson Crusoe, whatever. But I bypassed that and went right to Ian Fleming. My dad had Fantastic. Ian Fleming and James Bond. Yeah. Okay. And I'm reading, I'm saying, 
books have yeah. this in? You know, yeah. and so you get the curiosity of, well, I wonder what's in that one. Yeah. Or I wonder what's in that exactly. one. Exactly, right. That's where, you know, that's where we went. Now, yeah. when it came down to the reading list in high school, I sort of got to the point where I, Wuthering Heights, uh, no. I, it's mystified me since I was in high school, and I've always felt this way, that uh, I don't understand the uh, high school English curriculum. Mm -hmm. Why, when there are so many exciting, uh, engrossing, you know, maybe a little bit racy mm -hmm. uh, books that would really hook high school kids, why we insist on having them read books that they're not emotionally or experientially right. ready to read you know i mean scarlet letter is a terrific novel i've read it as an adult mm -hmm. uh i having it assigned as a four, 15 year old kid was like hammering a nail into my head it was just painful <laughs> absolutely uh, yeah. and i don't know why we do that yeah and the other like and then the other just to me, terrible thing, taking them off the bookshelves. Well, we don't want our kid to read Catcher in the Rye. Yeah. Okay. All right. But it to has, sort of it, ban it, it or to, you know, keep the kids away from it, say, don't read that book, which really would entice them to go, I think I'm going to go yeah, find exactly. that book. Exactly. A good, good yeah. way of getting them yeah. to, <laughs> to get, maybe to be excited it. Yeah. about it. Yeah. But no, it's, um, uh, I, I don't, under, I was a teenager. You know, so I know what teenagers think about all mm. the time. You bet. And I know how they talk to each other. Um, and I don't understand parents who think that somehow they're going to prevent adolescence from happening. Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> if, you know what? If we could figure that out, we'd, we'd be in pretty good well, shape. <laughs> well, uh, raising kids did teach me why the uh, – Wealthy aristocracy invented boarding school. Yeah. 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 Send them away. Ex Get rid there's of them. There's a phase Let them of handle. their lives when they should just be with each other and right. not in society. That's yeah. right. Just uh, bring them back for a week at Christmas. Can't <laughs> wait to them after seven days. And then a week back in the summer, and then we're going to send Off them away go to, camp. to summer yeah, camp. And right. we'll just we'll let them take care of that. But that's why I recommend Book of Charlie. I think if you have been a reader or uh, and you've lost it, or if you're a young person out there and you've lost it, um, the book of Charlie will get you right back into it because it is just terrific. And Thank you. the triangle, I know we haven't talked about that much. The fire that changed America was about the shirtwaist fire in New York City, which I had no idea. And triangle was the name of the company. And I had no idea that this had happened. And I think just to capsulize it, even the less than Reader's Digest version, is I think it was – the most tragic event in New York until 9-11. Is yeah. that correct? There were more people lost in this fire, mostly women and young girls who worked in the Irish immigrants, the Italian immigrants who worked in the garment industry uh, d during that time. Yeah, you know, this, was, this was the biggest factory, clothing factory in New York in 1911, and it was on the top three floors of what, what they – called skyscrapers in those days. It's a 10-story building uh, right in the heart of Manhattan, just uh, a block east of uh, Washington Square. Right. Um, and it, it bore an eerie resemblance to 9-11 uh, in a couple of ways, uh, in part because it was people trapped by fire right. uh, in a very tall building, that, uh, uh, and they had, in many cases, to decide uh, whether they were going to die in the flames or whether they were going to leap to their deaths. And like 9-11, this was before television, but uh, thousands of people were in Washington Square that day when the fire broke out, and so huge throngs of people saw this happening in front of their eyes, Right, and it was... Uh, a, tremendously important event in New York history, but um, in ways forgotten. I'm really one of the uh, most proud things of my life is that this uh, book did bring the triangle story you know, back for a new generation. And in fact, um, we tried to create a, a list of the victims at the back of the book. They'd never been named 
before that, and then in a you know what they call crowdsourcing now, readers have taken my list, which is very imperfect, and have you know gone into the genealogical records to improve them. They've found they've perfected that list. They've uh, identified the six previously unidentified victims. Mm -hmm. So we now have all 146 names, and they're going to be inscribed in a beautiful monument that's going to be at the building where the fire took place. It's going to be unveiled uh, next month. Yeah, um, the old Ash building. Yeah. Right. So uh, these forgotten names are going to be restored to uh, history, right. and I had a small part in that. Yeah, that's wonderful. That's great. And um, for us not to forget as right. well. and. The research you had to do on this, as I'm reading, I'm, I've just got done with the fire, and I'm only halfway through the book. Folks, there's a lot more to it than the fire. I'm into the, the chapter called Fallout, which means what happens after the fire. But you got to remember back in those days, the fire trucks were pulled by horses, okay, and there were water wagons, and the fire hydrants didn't always work, mm -hmm. and the ladders couldn't get above the sixth floor, I think, of buildings. Right. And there was a tremendous outcry when people started building the high rises, high rises that people would come back and say, "We, we can't, if we have a fire, we, we're not going to be able to get up there. They're not going to be able to get out of the building. There are going to be fire traps and nobody listened. It was all right. about money yep. and, and the whole thing. But I, I'm, I'm just going to read one line. And this might either chase them away from the book <laughs> or bring them to the book, okay, because I find it absolutely fascinating. Pretty Jenny Stern suffocated, smashed, incinerated. Yeah. And it is, the book is, you bring out what really happened. There's no flowery verse in here or prose on this. This was a horrifying event in New York that took the lives of so many innocent people. And if they would have just done a couple of things the yeah. right way, instead of locking doors and all that sort of stuff, it would have never happened. Yeah. It would have just been a fire in a building and they'd have put it out and rebuilt another building at that exactly. point. Exactly. So, yeah. Right. So, just terrific. And that is New York Times book review, notable book. And of course, the book of Charlie is a New York Times bestseller. And David, I can't thank you enough for coming in and sharing all this with us today. It was just, just terrific and, and enlightening. So, it's been my pleasure. You bet. Thanks. And he is another reason, folks, that there's just something about <laughs> Kansas City. <laughs> <laughs>